Okay, so thank you. Uh, before I start, uh, I just want to state the obvious. Uh, this session is going to last for an hour and 20 minutes. So, uh, like you're skipping two other talks and just, just to make sure that what you're signing up for. Um, I'm pretty sure that all these other talks are going to be like excellent, uh, but I just want to particularly mention Tonchi, who is going to uh, speak in like 25 minutes or so about Scenic and Elixir. And so this is a very interesting topic in case you want to uh, split, you know, I'm not going to hold a grudge against you. Uh, that being said, those who stay until the end uh, may get a chance to uh, win a free copy of Elixir in Action. So I have a couple of giveaways, uh, uh, one printed version, a couple of free ebook versions. So uh, if you stay until the end of the talk, uh, just approach me and uh, ask shamelessly for the book uh, without pretending that you're interested in anything else. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, thank you once again for joining me here in this talk where we're going to discuss the topic of parsing. And parsing is something that I feel, as an industry, we have developed a collective fear of, this irrational fear. Because like, whenever we need to parse something, even if it's more involved, we tend to go to these great lengths, you know, reach for this whole bag of tricks, do anything we can to avoid writing a parser. You know, so li like a lot of these uh, workarounds revolve around famous regular expressions, regexes, which, I mean, to be clear, they are like, uh, quite convenient, and I actually like regexes. Um, I'm going to rant a lot uh, about regexes, but I use them, and I think that they are like pretty fine in many simpler scenarios. But the problem with regexes, you know, and they're like super powerful, these modern PCRE style regexes, the problem with them is that they become super critical super fast. And uh, reading them, uh, or sorry, writing them becomes very hard. Reading them for me even much harder than that. And still, this doesn't stop us. You know, we write a lot of regexes, and when we hit some limits of regexes, what do we do? We push further, you know, we improvise. So we run regexes from within different loops, conditionals, and whatnot. And we are essentially building ad hoc parsers, which, I mean, kind of work, but uh, they are really hard to understand. You know, are we actually doing everything properly? And then another technique that I have seen, admittedly not so frequently, but still occasionally, revolves around the evil mechanism. You know, so like uh, when I need to parse some input, and let's say that I'm writing code in JavaScript, you know, what I could do is, through a series of search and replaces, typically again propelled by regexes, I convert the input into JavaScript, then I invoke the evil function, and presto, I have parsed, you know, that stuff. And it's a nice little hack, you know, makes you feel proud about yourself when it really shouldn't. And uh, I mean, it's uh, really something that becomes also hard to understand, you know, are we accepting everything that we should? And not to mention that we're uh, introducing potentially very dangerous attack vector in uh, this freeform evaluation. Uh, then a pet peeve of mine, and I would say a true testament of how we are scared of parsing, happens when we have to expose some programmatic uh, interface to our product, you know, some kind of a DSL that our users use to uh, programmatically control our product. And so what do we do then? Most frequently, we reach for these declarative languages like uh, XML, YAML, uh, JSON, presumably because they are super trivial to parse. You know, it's a one-liner invocation. And then you end up with these strange concoctions where uh, people have to write for loops in YAML, or they need to write uh, conditional expressions in uh, JSON, and you need to deal with all these escaping problems, double quoting and whatnot. And I'm not really a fan of those approaches. I think that these declarative languages are first and foremost made to state facts, not code, you know. So today, only for you, only in this beautiful city, I'm going to propose this new revolutionary heretical idea, uh, the idea of choosing the approach of choosing the approach uh, which is suitable for the problem at hand. You know, and uh, what this means in particular, that when we need to parse something, we are actually going to write a parser uh, by choosing some of the well-known, well-understood parsing techniques. And in particular, I'm going to choose a technique which is called parser combinators. So you may have seen already the intro by Ju. Uh, how many of you have been in that talk yesterday? Okay, yeah, quite a lot. So this is basically going to be an expanded version of that talk, except there will be no singing and there will be no uh, Akio magic, you know, but other than that, it's like an expanded version. Um, now, uh, yeah, we are going to choose these parser combinators because they are, in my very limited experience, uh, one of the simplest and most intuitive parsing techniques which we are currently aware of, and still they are like super powerful. It's incredible what you can parse with these parser combinators. And uh, yeah, by choosing this approach, uh, we are going to forsake the road of instant gratification and quick solutions. We are not going to go over to Stack Overflow and copy paste some highly upvoted and equally highly critical regular expression. We are actually going to invest some time to produce the solution ourselves. And this is going to require more time, and it's going to require some thinking, and it's going to require uh, 
or the total solution is going to be much longer. You know, it's not going to be just one liner. It's going to be like about 150 lines of code. Uh, but on the upside, we will produce the code which we can actually understand, which we can reason about, we can grasp its uh, current feature set, its current limitations, and which we can enhance, you know, move forward in a relatively straightforward fashion. And I believe that these are all very noteworthy benefits when it comes to, you know, building a code which is supposed to be running in production and which is supposed to be uh, maintained for some longer amount of time. And in the process, we will convince ourselves that writing a parser isn't all that difficult. It's not like you have to, you know, acquire a PhD and then spend next year or so before you get your first implementation. You can actually get started pretty quickly, reasonably easily, you know. So, yeah, uh, the whole implementation is going to last like around 60 minutes or so uh, with explaining stuff and coding everything from scratch without using any third party library. So our challenge of the day is to parse this small subset of SQL. Um, by the way, those in the back, can you see this clearly? Is it large enough? Yeah, cool. If you have problems, let me know, and I'm just going to uh, enlarge the font. So yeah, we want to parse like a small subset of SQL, uh, only the select statement and only a very small part of select statements. So uh, we can select one or multiple columns. If there are more of them, then they are separated by the character comma. And uh, another feature is there is this from clause. In the simplest version, we reference a table directly from the database by its name. And then as a twist, we support subqueries, you know. So this is a nice little example of a recursive language where you have query within a query within a query and so on and so forth. Now, this is not an academic example. It's not a contrived example. Uh, uh, at uh, the company I used to work for, Aircloak, we actually implemented an SQL parser because we needed it. Uh, it was quite featureful, so supported, you know, subqueries, different type of joins, complex expressions with binary, unary operators, function invocations, parentheses, operator precedence, and whatnot, all over the query in select list, in uh, where filters, having group bys, and so on. Um, obviously, I'm not gonna, I don't have the time to do all of that. Uh, but I am going to provide some uh, some impressions from that experience once I'm done with the implementation. So this is what we want to parse, you know. And uh, before starting to frantically bang against the keyboard, we are actually going to, you know, try to figure out what do we want to get from this implementation. So this is our input. It's a freeform string. And the first thing that we need to do is discard any input which is invalid, which does not adhere to the rules of the language collectively known as grammar. And so we discard invalid input. Somehow we report an error. And I can tell you uh, right up front that uh, reported errors are going to suck terribly in my implementation. Uh, so like getting a proper error reporting is not really all that difficult, but it requires a little bit of time. So I'm not going to do this in the code, but I'm going to provide some sketches once I'm done with the implementation. Uh, on the upside, uh, we will discard everything which is invalid. And already to me, this is like a huge upgrade from using regexes. Like with those things, you know, maybe it's just me, maybe I'm too stupid, but with regexes, when they are be become a little bit more complex, I'm never really certain, I cannot convince myself, you know, am I accepting everything that I should and am I rejecting everything that I should? And here, you know, it's going to be much easier. And another uh, important benefit is that we, in fact, can provide useful, interesting error messages, you know, messages which are informative for our users, which as far as I know, is not really all that possible or it's very difficult with regexes. So anyway, uh, we discard any input which is invalid, and now we are left with valid inputs. And so what do we do with those? We turn a valid input, we turn this non-structure into a structure. We return some sort of a structured, well-shaped data. So I'm going to implement this solution in Elixir, and this is what we're aiming for. This is called a map. It's a key value uh, structure, like this percentage sign curly brace means a map. Uh, I use it as a record, you know, just a bunch of named fields bundled together. And so we have the first field statement, statement indicating that this is a select statement. Uh, this colon something, you're going to see it uh, all over the code, so I want to clarify this. It's called an atom. It's a symbolic constant. You, if you know Ruby, then you basically have symbols. If you don't have this feature in your language, then you emulate it, like either by using enumerations or maybe by in declaring, say, a constant integer select equals one, and then you use select all over the place. This is the same thing except the compiler assigns the integer or the runtime assigns the integer, you know. Otherwise, pretty much the same thing. So, yeah, the statement is select. Then we have the columns field, which is a list of columns. And then from, the simpler case down in the bottom, the from uh, is a string referencing a table from the database. And here we have a from is a map. 
uh, which represents or has that same structure, you know. So it's again query within a query and so on and so forth. It's a tree-like structure, if you will. And in fact, this thing is called AST, AST, abstract syntax tree, which is just a fancy way of saying that we are somehow structuring the input. Now, uh, once you have this input structure, then you can do some interesting stuff. And this is the point of parsing. It's not the end of the job, it's the preparatory phase, you know. So like uh, at Airclock, we did a bunch of stuff with that. Uh, with those input SQL queries, first and foremost, we would verify, do these tables even exist in the database? Do the columns exist in those tables? Are the types matching and so on and so forth? This is collectively known as semantic checks or semantic validation. And then we would actually fetch the data from the database. And we supported a bunch of different backends like SQL Server, MySQL, PostgreSQL, Oracle, DB, and so on and so forth. And those are like different flavors of SQL. So we would have to do a little bit of transpiling to uh, DB-specific SQL. Uh, we also supported MongoDB. So then we had to do a bunch of MongoDB queries, you know, to handle a single input SQL statement. You know, but the whole point is whatever you want to do, you can do this because your data is now structured, right? And so you can write some code, some algorithm, which traverses this structure and, you know, does something with it. And that's the point of parsing, and that's the focus of today's talk. So, yeah, this is what we want to implement. Uh, I'm going to code this thing again in Elixir, which I presume is the language many of you are not super familiar with. I'm going to use parser combinators, which I hope that is a technique many of you are not familiar with, or otherwise you may again want to reconsider your choice of talk in this session. Um, but the point is that like some things m are inevitably going to fly over your heads, or not inevitably, but probably, possibly, you know, maybe. And uh, if uh, that uh, happens, uh, try, try to focus on like the mid to high level arc of the story. Try not to obsess about every syntactical detail. That being said, because we are given way more time than I uh, originally planned for, uh, I can be more relaxed, I can take questions uh, during the session, so like if you're getting completely lost, raise a hand, pop a question, we're going to try to figure it out, but still, you know, let's try to keep any kind of side discussion, you know, until the end of the talk. So, okay, finally time to implement this. We're going to do all of that in that single file, which is a part of the project, uh, simply for demo purposes, but I'm not going to use any third-party dependencies. I'm going to write everything from scratch. Typically, most of the stuff I'm going to write for you, you actually get as a part of a third-party library. So, uh, but I think that this is going to be like uh, more easier to grasp, you know, these concepts. So this is the skeleton of our program. We have run, this is the single public function. This is our entry point, which is somehow invoked. I declare some input, which is a string variable, print it to screen, and then I invoke the parse function. And so then in parse, I actually have to parse the input. Currently, I'm just returning nil. So one minor thing about Elixir, there is no return statement. In Elixir, everything is an expression, and the result of the last expression uh, in the function is the return value of the function itself. And so when, I, when you see down below, can you, you all in the back, can you see that? Okay. So yeah, here we have like the debug output. We see the input, uh, and then we see whatever the function returns here. And if I change this thing and uh, save, like if I say, for example, OK, then we see OK down below. So that's, that's going to be our primary, our only method of verifying stuff. OK, so we want to parse select full from bar, right? And obviously, I cannot write a parser uh, for that immediately off the bat. So uh, I'm going to work in small steps. And you know, we're going to spend actually a lot of time working in these small steps. Uh, so tying back to what Andrew said yesterday in his talk, we are going to make the change easy. We're going to invest some work to make the final change easy. So I'm going to start super simple, very unspectacular. I'm going to start by parsing a single character, any character. You know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but as the saying goes, even the journey of a thousand miles has to start with a single small step. So we are going to parse that single character from the input. And uh, let's write this thing. So private function, private function, char, takes an input. And so with respect to input, we have two possible outcomes, two possible scenarios. Scenario number one, input is an empty string. And in this case, I cannot, in fact, parse, uh, parse a single character. So I have to return an error. So I'm going to return this pair, starting with the atom error and some error description, like uh, uh, unexpected end of input. And so like this is still a semi-useful. Uh, this is still a semi-useful error. Ignore that stuff here. You know, it's going to happen occasionally while I'm in the middle of the coding. So this is still sup somewhat useful, uh, but rest assured that uh, our error, uh, the quality of our reported errors is going to downgrade very soon. You know, it's going to be all downhill from here. So anyway, uh, this is one scenario. And then I have another, oh, just a small clarification. So this thing here, it's called a tuple when it's in just the curly braces. It's just a bunch of values bundled together without name, you know. So that's basically it. Anyway, so this is uh, one 
Option, option number two, input is a non-empty string, which in Elixir I can express as follows. Input starts with a single character, which is a UTF-8 code point, and this is then followed by the rest of the input, which is of type binary. And binary means a bunch of bytes. Every string is binary in Elixir. Not every binary is a string. You know, so in this case, I can parse the single character, and I'm going to return a triplet, which starts with the atom OK. This is then followed by char, and this is going to be an integer, a code point, like an ASCII code, if you will. You know, if it's a capital letter A, it's going to be 65, and if it's a white space, it's going to be 32, and so on and so forth. And then I'm returning the rest of the input. And so when I save this thing, immediately you can see the success. So we're returning OK, 115, elect foo from bar. It even means something, you know, kind of means something. Uh, and obviously, if the input is the empty string, uh, then we should and we do return an error. OK, so admittedly, you know, this was a small step for humankind, but for us it was in fact one giant leap because we have formalized what the concept of parser means is in this tiny little program. And parser for us today is going to be every function which takes exactly one argument, which is the input, and has only these two types of results. It either returns OK, and then this second element, I'm going to call it a parse term. This is literally an est. This is uh, like the syntax representation of a ch character in this particular case, and otherwise it's going to be more complex ests. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm going to call it a parsed term, and then this thing here is the rest of the input. So that's one possible result. Result number two, uh, error, so the pair error and some explanation of an error. Now I'm going to introduce the concept of parser combinators. Henceforth, I will call them just combinators. And the combinator, mechanically speaking, is going to be a function which uh, uh, returns a parser according to the contract that I have just uh, formalized or mentioned. So I can turn this char into a combinator by making it return an anonymous function which uh, you know, takes an input and does exactly what the previous version did. So char is now a combinator because it returns a parser. Memorize this thing. This is a very important thing. Combinator returns a parser. And so the usage becomes a little bit more different and involved. So now I need to invoke char, and this returns a function, which I take into a variable. And now I can invoke this function by passing it the input. Typically, in most languages, you would do something like this. In Elixir, there is like this teeny tiny little complication. I also need to use this dot operator when I'm invoking an anonymous function. Do not ask why, but there are valid reasons for this, and this is like stuff in the language which is definitely not going to change. You know? So that's what you need to do when you're invoking an anonymous function. You know, which is this. This is an invocation of a named function, and here I don't need the dot operator. So anyway, you know, when I save this thing, we get the same thing. This is now semantically equivalent version of the previous version. It's obviously a bit more complicated, which begs the question why. And uh, the whole idea of these combinators is it uh, enables us, gives us a possibility to build new parsers on top of the existing ones. You know, and so this is still a kind of abstract, so I'm going to show you here uh, with a concrete example. Before I do that, just a small clarification. So this char is now a combinator. It returns a parser, right? And this parser here, I'm also going to call it char. So we have char the combinator and char the parser. I hope that you will be able to kind of uh, live with this uh, little bit of ambiguity. So anyway, I'm going to write another combinator slash parser, uh, and I'm going to call this thing satisfy. And satisfy. Uh, takes, so just another clarification, combinator can accept arbitrary number of arguments. You know, it can be zero or more, doesn't really matter. You know, and so satisfy in particular will accept two arguments. Argument number one, parser. Argument number two, a function which takes a single argument and does something. Uh, we'll see what it is. So the satisfy returns a parser, and that parser, what it will do when it has to parse the input, it will, it will invoke this parser to parse, whatever, you know, whatever the parser parses, so in this case a single character. And if this parser errors, satisfy returns the same error. If this parser succeeds, satisfy invokes this function here, passing us the term, the second element of that triplet. So the term, in this case, it's a char, right? And here, what I can do is return a Boolean, a true or false, to accept or reject uh, this term. So I can actually refine what the parser is parsing. So for example, I could say that this char, which is an integer, by the way, you know, as we remember, it has to be in the range of the code point of 0 to code point of 9. And now, obviously, I'm parsing only a digit character. You know, so I have refined what uh, the char does in this case. So I save this thing, and I have some sort of a error. What is my error? Uh, undefined functions. Oh, the error is that it's not implemented. OK. So yeah, uh, it's time to implement the satisfy combinator. So it takes a parser, and it takes the function, which I'm going to call acceptor, for example. Acceptor. OK. And this function returns uh, a parser. You know, it's a combinator. 
And so how do we write this thing? I have to invoke the parser. Let me just remove the mouse. Uh, passing it the given input, right? So this is where I'm just forwarding to whatever parser the client sends me. And if and only if this succeeds, which in Elixir I can express using the width expression. So if the result of this matches this pattern, so it's OK, some term, whichever, and the rest of the input, then are we going to do something, right? So this width, the way it works, if uh, this function here or this expression here returns anything else that is not an OK triplet, then we will return that same else. And that else can only be the error, right, as we know. But if it returns this triplet, then I enter the do block and do something with it. And what do I do? I invoke the acceptor function, passing it to the given term. If that function returns true, then we succeed as well with the same result. Else, we return an error, um, term rejected. And this is a good example of a bad messages that we are going to send. You know, what term is rejected where? You know, no clue. You know, but it's a solvable problem, and we're going to discuss it at the final part of the talk. And as soon as I've saved this, I get this like super useful error message, right? The term is rejected. Uh, we know why, because uh, you know, I'm trying to parse a digit character, but the first character is an ASCII letter. You know, but if I try like with number five, and now I get OK53 okay, select foo from bar. And so the next thing that I can do, I can take this expression and extract it into a function, a well-named function, with a, which reveals intention, you know, which is more clearer in its meaning. So I could call this function, say, a digit, and just copy-paste that over here. And this, to me, is the gist of what combinators are about. You know, I am building a more specific parser, a digit parser, by combining the existing two, the satisfy and the char. That's the whole idea of parser combinators. You know, it's not all that complex once you think about it. So in the same way, I could combine those two to build an ASCII letter, for example. So an ASCII letter, a little bit different condition. Character has to be in the range of uppercase A to uppercase Z, or character, hist character has to be in the range of uh, in the range of lowercase a to lowercase z. And we're not going to test this one out, but uh, we're going to use it definitely. Rest assured that whatever we write is actually going to be used in uh, production code, right, in final version. Another thing that I could do is I could write a char function, which takes a single argument, expected, and you know matches just a particular, that single character. And this is also pretty similar stuff. Satisfy characters such that uh, character is equal to whatever the client wants it to be. And then what I can do here, uh, like notice, by the way, how in this parse function, I'm only changing this thing here right side, right of the parse. The rest of the code remains the same. This is because the contract of the parser is formalized. It always follows the same shape. It takes a single argument and then uh, returns uh, the same kind of results. So yeah, I could write, say, character underscore. And uh, now here, you know, let's save this thing. Uh, oops, I have an error someplace. Uh, yeah, I'm missing a colon here. OK. Yeah, I have some warnings here. Those are fine. I'm not invoking these functions. That's going to happen occasionally. Anyway, I'm re rejecting the uh, number five in front. Uh, if I have just a letter, I'm also going to reject that. And if I have the underscore, then I'm accepting it, returning 95, which is, of course, the code point of the underscore character. OK, so I'm going to declare that this is like a milestone number one. You know, At this point, we have formalized the parser contract. We have formalized what a uh, parser combinator is. And we have a couple of these nice little combinators. And so the next phase uh, that I want to do is I want to be able to parse an identifier. Now, identifier is a word where uh, all the characters or every character is either uh, an ASCII letter, an underscore, or a number. So these are like example of two separate identifiers. Uh, typically, I shouldn't allow that to have like a digit in front. Uh, I'm going to ignore this. I'm going to disregard it for the sake of brevity, but rest assured that it's really not all that complicated, you know. And the final implementation is left as an exercise for the reader. So uh, anyway, uh, this is what we want to get. And now in order to do this, we need a couple of more uh, of these like general purpose combinators such as satisfy. The first one I'm going to introduce, I'm going to call it a choice. Uh, elsewhere, you may also hear about it as uh, one-off, for example. So choice takes a list of parsers as its single argument. So I could say choice as key letter, character underscore, or say a digit, a digit. And it basically does what you would expect it to do. So uh, it's an either or, you know, or, or uh, kind of parser either ASCII letter or a character underscore or uh, a digit character. Uh, if none of them matches, then we return an error. So writing this thing down, choice takes a list of parsers. It is a combinator. Hence, you know, it has to return this same kind of function. So with respect to the list of parsers, we have two possible outcomes. 
If it's an empty list, we actually return an error because no parser succeeded. So I can say no parser succeeded. Hope I pronounced it or spelled that properly. Um, and otherwise, it's a non-empty list, which in Elixir I can express as follows. The list starts with the first parser, and it's then followed by the list of other parsers. And in this case, what am I going to do? I'm going to try to apply this fir first parser on the given input. If and only if this fails, which again I can express using the with expression, so I'm going to get OK, not OK, I'm going to get an error in some reason, and I don't care about that reason, so I'm going to put an underscore prefix here. Uh, so only in this case, we are going to do what? We are going to try choice of other parsers on that same input. And this is our choice implementation. You know? So if this thing succeeds, if it returns OK triplet, then we're going to return that OK triplet, else we try with, with other parsers. You know? It's a nice little recursion. And so as soon as I save this thing, here I'm parsing a character F, so I'm accepting a letter. I'm accepting the underscore, I'm accepting a digit, and then if it's a white space in the beginning, then I'm rejecting it. So like this manual test hopefully proves that it seems to be working, you know, uh, hopefully it works. Uh, so that's one important thing, and let's immediately extract this thing into a separate well-named thing called identifier, identifier uh, char, right? So a single character in an identifier. Okay. And now the next thing that we want to do, let's just you know, beautify this uh, first identifier. So I want to be able to consume all of these identifier characters in a single pass. And for that thing, I'm going to introduce a combinator called many. Many takes a single parser and does pretty much what you would expect it to do. It tries to apply it as much as it can in a greedy fashion. Um, for the sake of simpler implementation, I'm going to, uh, so before I get to that, uh, just let me clear. So many is going to consume all of these characters, and it's going to return a list. And this is the first example where our returned term is a bit more complex. So it's going to return a list which is uh, code point of F followed by the code point of O followed by the code point of O. Um, I have like an extra comma here, and then followed by the code point underscore, and then followed by code point of one. Right, so this is what the, it's going to return. Um, for the sake of simplicity, I'm also going to allow many to succeed even if it cannot apply the given parser not even once. Uh, and in that case, it's going to return an empty list. Okay? And so think of it like an equivalent of the asterisk, the star character in the regular expression. It pretty much uh, kind of behaves in the same way. The greedy version, of course. Uh, so let's write this thing down. Many combinator, right? Takes a single parser and it returns a parser. And so how do we parse this thing multiple times? We apply the parser on the given input, and this can either succeed or fail. Let's handle the failure first. So I get an error, and I get some reason. And as we said, in this case, we are going to succeed, returning OK. The list is empty, and the rest of the input is the same input, right? Because I haven't consumed a single character. So that's one thing. Another thing, we get OK, and we get the first term. And we get, uh, we get the rest of the input after the term has been consumed. What do we do in this case? We return, we try more, right? So many of the same parser on the rest of the input. And in this case, uh, we know that we will succeed because many always succeeds. So we will return OK. And then, uh, sorry, we will get OK. We will get the list of other terms. And uh, then we will get the rest of the input after everything has been consumed. And now we can succeed as well, returning the list which starts with the first term, and it's followed by the list of other terms, and then, of course, the rest of the input after everything has been consumed. And if I'm done everything properly, this thing already consumed this list of code points, you know, and you can see because it stops the third thing there. Um, so here, hang on, that thing here, it stops at white space bar two. You know, so we have now our identifier parser. It's basically many identifier characters, right? It should be relatively self-explanatory. Let's extract this into a separate function. Uh, so def p identifier, and just like this. So that's all well and fine, but as I said, the problem is that many uh, also succeeds if it cannot apply the parser not even once, you know? So if I have like a white space here in the input, and uh, many succeeds returning the empty list for an identifier. And that kind of sucks because identifier shouldn't really be uh, an empty. We shouldn't allow empty identifiers, right? That doesn't really make sense. And, but this is like a super trivial problem to solve already. Uh, let me just expand this into a full-blown version 
so uh, like this into full body. Basically, what I need to do is I need to combine this thing with satisfy. You know, we have a question. Where is it that uh, it stops at the white space? Um, it stops because uh, it cannot apply identifier char not even once. So many itself, okay, yeah. It tries to apply identifier char as much as it can. The first character is not an identifier char because it's not an ASCII letter, it's not an underscore, and it's not a digit. And hence, many applies it just zero times and stops. Yes, there it is. It's either an ASCII letter, oops, it's either an ASCII letter or underscore or a digit. Okay? Cool. Okay, uh, so. J just a note. So I'll be in the back and just raise a hand if you have a question, I will come in. Sure. Mic. Um, yeah, so uh, this thing is now the problem of empty identifier is easily solvable. You know, if I combine this thing with satisfy, so I say satisfy many identifier characters such that, and so here I get chars, a list of those code points. It's a non-empty list, right? And something like this, bam, and now we are rejecting the term. Again, super useful error, but at least it works. Uh, if I remove the white space character, we are still accepting it, you know? so. That's like a simple stuff to do. Now, another thing is, uh, so this is an est. It's a structured, repre structured representation, uh, but it sucks, you know, like a bunch of integers. What does it even mean? So what I really want to get is a string back from this. And to do that, I could introduce another combinator, which I'm going to call map. So map takes a parser as a first argument, and then it also takes function, which receives one argument. And so the way a map works, if this thing here uh, fails to parse, map returns the same error. If it succeeds, it invokes this function, passing us the term. So this here will be chars. And what I can do here is convert this term into something else. I can affect what is going to be returned as a second argument or, or the sorry, second element of that triplet. You know, so I could say 42, and now the parser always returns 42, no matter what it parses. Uh, more realistically, of course, I want to turn these chars into string, so I can say to string of chars, and to string is a standard library function, which is going to do exactly what we want it to do. Given a list of code points, it returns a string. And so I obviously need to write this thing. So map takes a parser and a mapper function. Um, we don't have a question? I thought I heard something. No? Okay, so map takes a parser and a mapper function. Again, it's a combinator returning a parser, so we try to parse that input. If and only if this succeeds, so we get OK, we get term, and we get rest of the input, we are going to return OK, and instead of term, we are going to invoke the mapper function to convert this term into whatever the client wants it to be, and then we are going to return the same rest of the input, and I have an error someplace. Um, uh, hang on a second. Uh, yo, this is terribly wrong. Sorry. So I need to invoke parser on the given input, right? Uh, okay, better. And now you can see that the second argument is uh, converted, or the second element is converted into a string. And so now I'm extracting a single term. So I'm going to declare that this is like milestone number two. Now the next thing that we need to handle are white spaces. You know, so we can have multiple white spaces here. We can have multiple white spaces here. We can have, you know, new lines. So, and we need to handle all of this. You know, when I try to invoke this thing, I get term rejected. I, I didn't even move a single step because I have a white space in the beginning. Uh, but that's not what I want. You know, when I want to consume the next identifier, I want to consume full one. You know, so that's what we're moving towards in this next iteration. Now to do this, I'm going to need another general purpose combinator, which I'm going to call. Uh, oh, hang on, I got ahead of myself. So just one little thing, uh, obviously this thing here, this mapping, actually belongs to uh, the function identifier, right? So I want to map this thing um, such that, uh, so like this. Okay, so now I obviously have some error. This is the error, okay. Um, yeah, let's just, to make sure that it still works, let me just add full one. So, and obviously here I want to have identifier, like this. So I just wanted to extract this mapping into identifier because it's an implementation detail. Now, uh, one thing that I wanted to show with this is uh, you have this, uh, like this is what happens with parser combinators. You get this staircasing very quickly, you know, early in the game. So you invoke full of bar, of buzz, and so on and so forth. And that kind of, you know, becomes cu uh, cumbersome to read. Now, in Elixir, you can actually flatten this thing using the pipe operator. 
So this is the pipe operator. You have some expression on the left, and you have some function invocation on the right, some fun, you know, that takes some argument. And at compile time, this is transformed into function, and this expression is injected as the first argument of uh, that invocation, and all the others are following. And so given that thing, um, we can, you know, uh, straighten or flatten this expression uh, by doing the following. So uh, many pipes to let me just inline this thing. Uh, pipe to satisfy. So let's move this thing here. And then pipe to this map. And I think I need to miss just to skip this um, comma. And that's it. And hopefully it reads a little bit nicer. You know, what is an identifier? It's many identifier characters such that they form a non-empty list and convert it into a string. You know, I would argue that this is like a pretty expressive and intention revealing uh, nice little parser. You know, okay. So again, going back to that problem. So we want to uh, handle white spaces. Um, and, uh, you know, for this, I'm going to build another general purpose combinator, which I'm going to call sequence. And uh, sequence, let's write it down. So we have an ASCII letter, uh, and then we have, for example, character underscore, and then we have digits. So it takes a single argument, uh, which is a list of parsers. And uh, again, it's going to do what it says on the tin. You know, it's going to try to match this particular sequence, an ASCII letter followed by the digit underscore, uh, sorry, followed by the character underscore, followed by a digit character. Only that sequence, nothing else, you know. So that would basically be something like A underscore one. OK, so let's write this thing down. Sequence takes a list of parsers. Again, it's a combinator, so we return this thing. Uh, this we return the parser. So what do we do? With respect to the list of parsers, we have two possible outcomes. It's an empty list, in which case we will actually succeed, because no parser failed, hence all of the parsers succeeded. right? And so we return OK empty list and the rest of the input, which is the same input because we haven't really consumed anything. And then option number two, it's a non-empty list, which again I can express as follows. The list starts with the first parser and is then followed by the list of other parsers. Now in this case, I'm going to try to apply the first parser on the given input. If and only if this succeeds, I'm going to get OK and the first term and the rest of the input. And in this case, what am I going to do? I'm going to try to uh, try to apply the sequence of the other parsers on the rest of the input. Uh, this is extra, something like this. If and only if this succeeds as well, I'm going to get OK, the list of other terms, and the rest of the input. And in this case, we will succeed as well, returning OK, and the list which starts with the first term is followed by other terms and the rest of the input after everything has been consumed. And as soon as I save this thing, again, we are matching A underscore 1 and returning this particular sequence. So again, it's a nice little recursive implementation. If I add some character, like um, whatever, you know, then it's rejecting it. So it appears to be working. Now with this in place, uh, let's go back to the original problem. You know, so we have this thing here, bunch of new lines, and I have foo one, and then I have here like bar two, and I want to be able to get the next identifier. So to do this, <coughs> I'm going to uh, I'm going to create a combinator which I'm going to call token, and token takes a single parser as its argument. In this case, it's going to be identifier, and what token is going to do is it's going to skip zero or more of the leading white spaces. Then it's going to parse whatever the parser parses. This is the identifier in this case. And then it's going to skip all the trailing white spaces, stopping exactly, oops, stopping exactly at B, at bar 2. And uh, the term it's going to return is just this thing in the middle. You know, So it just parses this thing in the middle, discarding the white spaces. And now I can build this token of on top of the existing stuff. You know, so this is like called tokenization. Sometimes also lexical analysis. There are like some subtle differences, but uh, uh, you know, basically it's the idea of picking this stuff uh, and removing these white spaces, these things that we don't really need uh, for subsequent parsing. So yeah, I'm going to call this thing token takes a parser, right? Or whatever it parses. And so uh, what is a token? It's a sequence which starts with zero or more of white space characters. And white space character can be a choice of character backslash s, 
So this is the same as writing 32. It's a white space character uh, or backslash n. You know, I should have to support some more of those, like backslash r, backslash t, and so on, but this is going to suffice for our needs. So zero or more white spaces, followed by whatever the parser parses, followed by zero or more of trailing white spaces. And as soon as I save this thing, what you see down below is uh, that we are really consuming full one and all of these surrounding tens and 32s, new lines and white spaces, and stopping right there at b of bar two. And now it's only a matter of purifying this result of cleaning this uh, mess, you know, uh, that we don't need, these uh, white spaces, and that's a matter of just piping or combining this sequence with a mapper, you know. So here I will get exactly three elements. Why? Because here I have three elements, right, in the sequence. So I'm going to get leading white spaces I don't care about. I'm going to get the term I care about and trailing white spaces I don't care about, and I'm going to return the term, and bam, we are still parsing foo underscore one, but now we are discarding these white spaces. And now, for exam example, I could say something like uh, many, many token identifiers, and we are now returning a list of foo one bar two and disregarding all of these white spaces in the process. So this is like a big step. You know, it may seem that we are not doing really all anything spectacular, but we are li really laying the groundwork, which is going to make the, the final implementation like super easy to do. Okay, so the only big challenge remaining is the following one. So, uh, okay, like this. Uh, we have select statement, right? And we have column one, column two, comma, column three. And now what I want to do is uh, I want to be able to parse this list of selected columns separated by the comma character. And uh, of course, to make matters worse, these commas can be, you know, surrounded by a bunch of white spaces. And then there can be also zero white spaces in between. Uh, and so if I have something like this, uh, you know, I want to be able to parse column one, two, and three, and column four is not a part of this list anymore because it's not separated by the comma. So for this, we are going to write another thing, which I'm going to call sequence, another combinator slash parser. And sequence takes two arguments. Argument number one, the parser which parses the element of this sequence. So in this case, it's identifier token. Argument number two, the parser which parses a separator uh, which sits between two consecutive elements. And for us, this is token character comma. I'm using a token just again to make sure to delete all or to skip all the white spaces. You know, and so this is it. Let's write this sequence thingy. So sequence takes an element parser and it takes a separator parser like this. And the cool thing is that I need, don't need to write like this low-level combinator that returns a function uh, that accepts an input and whatnot. I can actually combine this thing on top of the existing ones. So what is a sequence? Uh, a sequence, sorry, I'm totally, this is not a sequence, this is separator parse, sorry. Okay. Little backtrack, this is called separated list. We already have sequence, right? So separated list. Uh, what is a separated list? Uh, it is a sequence which starts with the first element, and that is whatever the element parser parses. And this is then followed by zero or more sequences of separator followed by an element. You know, so you have like one, optionally comma two, optionally comma three, optionally comma four, and so on and so forth. And this is our separated list. And as soon as I save this thing, we can see, you know, so we have again column one, column two, column three. There is no comma here, so column four does not belong to that list. And we are indeed consuming this column one, two, and three, and the rest of the input is column four, so this is not included in a separated list. So now it's again just a matter of removing these 44s. These are the comma characters, and you see here that the second element here is the list, which I need to flatten out. You know, this is just a matter again of mapping the thing, combining this thing with a mapper. So I get function, here I have first, uh, let's call this thing first element. And then I have something I'm going to call rest, which is this uh, list which I uh, highlighted down below. And so from the rest, I actually have to extract the other elements, you know. So other elements are, uh, I need to walk through the rest. And each element of this rest is a two element list. So it has a comma character we don't care about. And then it has the element itself that I want to extract. I return this element and then I just return the list which starts with the first element and it's then followed by the list of other elements. And now here you can see below that we are indeed uh, taking the separated, a comma separated list from our input stopping at column four. So now we are like super close to parsing a basic select statement. Let's just add here select uh, blah, blah, blah from some table. 
Uh, I'm going to add just a small parser here. Uh, so let's first extract this thing so I don't have to write it again into, let's say, columns. Um, fp columns like this. OK, so the one thing that I want to do, I want to be able to detect the keyword. Like this is a select keyword, which can be, you know, in mixed case because uh, SQL is case insensitive as far as I know, uh, at least in some flavors. And uh, yeah, so I, I want to write uh, something like this, a parser, which is keyword select. And I'm sending an atom here as a normalized form of, uh, you know, I don't want to guess the casing here. So this is a pretty trivial stuff. You know, what is a keyword? Uh, of course, expected keyword. So basically, it is identifier, identifier token such that, I'm just missing this thing here, such that this identifier token, when, you know, it's case insensitive, so it's string dot upcase of identifier is equal to string dot upcase of expected, which I also need to convert into a string because it's an atom, like this. And you can tell immediately here I'm returning select. Uh, the little bit, uh, you know, clunky thing here is that I'm returning the casing that the user wrote, and I, I should really be returning a normalized version. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just pass this thing through mapper, ignoring whatever the user actually wrote, and returning what the client expects. So it's like in a normal form, and now I'm always returning the atom here. And at this point, believe it or not, we actually have all the building blocks we need to parse a select statement. So we are going to write select statement, statement like this. So what is a select statement? And this is where our change becomes easy. Select statement, it's a sequence which starts with a keyword select and is then followed by the selected columns. And this is then followed by keyword from. And then finally, the from clause itself is identifier token. Token identifier. And bam, here you can see that we are in fact parsing select column one, two, three from some table, consuming the entire input. You know, So this is a basic select statement. Now, uh, I want to turn this into a map. You know, This is like, again, this is an est, but I want to make it a little bit more uh, obvious for the client. So I'm just going to map this thing. And basically here I have four elements because I have four elements in the sequence. So I'm going to here ignore the select keyword. I'm going to say columns. And then I'm going to say ignore the from and just take the from value, the actual uh, thing that the user wrote. And what I'm going to return is a map. So we said statement is select. And then the columns, the value of columns is what we extracted, and the value of from is what we extracted. And now we have like a little bit nicer structured representation, right? And so it took some time, you know, but uh, I would argue that this is like a relatively uh, explicit code. It's not really cryptical, you know, so select statement is a select keyword. We have columns, and we have from and token identifier. What are columns? You know, it's a list, separated list of identifier tokens separated by the character comma. We have a question here. Hey, Sasha. Uh, great so far. I have a question, uh, which actually occurred to me like a few times I was also trying to do this. How would you propose doing, um, for example, uh, lookups into the already parsed parts of the, of, of the series that you're trying to parse? Like, for example, if you want to build a parser for C, you actually have to first define the type of the variable you want to create and then the variable name. So, of course, creating keywords for all built-in types, that's fine. But what if you actually have something that's dynamic, like user-created structs or type devs or something? You actually need to look behind for that, and it's really hard to do it um, from what I see currently. So I never wrote a parser for C, so I cannot tell you. Uh, talking about this, like, uh, academically, what I would do is I would parse any type followed by, uh, any type followed by the identifier name, and then a part of semantic validation would be, you know, is that type actually existing in this scope. You know, that's how I would try to approach the problem. Yeah, OK. Um, anyway, you know, this is like the s version one, but we're still not uh, supporting uh, subqueries. So I promise that like, this thing is going to be extensible, right? It's going to be straightforward to extend. And so what we need to do is, or what we want to do is parse subqueries. And this seems like a super complex change. You know, how are we going to do this? This is like recursive stuff, you know. Uh, it's going to be very terrible, and it's actually not. You know, so currently, of course, we're not supporting subqueries. But what, what is happening now that I'm supporting subqueries? The change in the grammar really happens in the from 
this is the only place where the grammar is changing. From can now accept an identifier or a subquery. And we can, you know, encode this thing by expressing or changing the corresponding part of the grammar. So now from is not just an identifier token, it's a choice between identifier token and a subquery, right? And so what is a subquery? So subquery, let's write it down below. Subquery uh, is, let me just move this up so you can see better. It's a sequence which uh, starts with token character opening parenthesis and something like this, hang on. Um, let me just write this thing like this because it's a little bit messy, okay. Hopefully it's right, so open character, uh, yeah, that's okay, I think it's fine. So this one is uh, just uh, whatever the code point of, uh, of the, oh, it's a closing parents, yeah, you're right. Okay, thank you very much. It's mob programming, you know, basics, uh, thank you. So yeah, it's uh, opening parenthesis, a token of course, and this is then followed by a select statement, which we are already parsing. And then we have, let's just write this thing over here, it's a closing parenthesis. Now, if I've done everything right, this thing is going to fail in a very particular way. And so let's give it a try, and yes, it's failing exactly as it's supposed to be failing. So this thing here doesn't return, as you can see. Uh, it actually ends up in an infinite loop, you know, let's break this thing uh, so, uh, you know, we don't spend energy uh, needlessly. So what's happening here? Uh, let me just show this piece here. So here I'm creating a parser. Right, so I'm invoking all these combinators, combining them, and ultimately I get a final lambda, final function, which parses the input. This is what you could call a compile time. Here I'm assembling the parser. And this is the runtime, right? So I pass the input to the given parser. Now what happens is when I invoke select statement, um, then, yeah, let's just go below. Select statement invokes subquery, and subquery invokes select statement, and you end up in this infinite recursion. Like it's basically an infinite loop. You know, and so a trick for this uh, is like relatively simple. Uh, I basically have to defer this creation of the parser for a subquery to the latest possible moment in time, to runtime. You know, when I'm parsing the input and I see the opening parenthesis, then I'm going to create another layer of this select statement. And so to do this, I'm going to introduce a combinator called lazy, which as an argument takes a combinator, which is basically a function just creating a parser. And so lazy is going to invoke this function at the latest possible moment when we actually need to parse some input. So I define this lazy and it takes a combinator itself. And so it's a parser. So what do we do at this point to you know, parse this thing? I'm going to invoke combinator which returns the parser to me and then I'm going to invoke that parser on the given input and with this, oh, Okay, so now I actually have to restart this thing. Uh, and with this little change, we are in fact parsing. So what you see here, uh, basically we have consumed like all this column one, two, three, from, 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 blah, blah, blah. The, the proof that we are parsing is that we have consumed this entire subquery, returning uh, an empty string as the rest of the input. And now it's again a matter of beautifying this result by removing these 40s and 42s, uh, sorry, 41s, which are, you know, open and closing parentheses. And this is a simple matter of mapping this thing. So here again I have three elements, opening parenthesis, then I have select statement, and then I have the closing parenthesis, and I'm only interested into a select statement. And with that little change, uh, I have to go scroll below now. Hang on a second. Now we are returning, let's just enlarge this for a little while, like this. So now we are returning this map exactly, which corresponds exactly to what I've shown you originally. Right, so here I'm selecting column one from is now a map following the same structure. Column two, three, yet another map. Columns four, five, six from, and in this case, it's reference to a direct table. And this is the full implementation of uh, that little parser, which weights around 160 lines of code. We have immediately a question here. So this is the implementation done. In case you want to uh, have an early break or something, feel free, or otherwise, uh, I have some discussions that I like, and we can have like a more informal discussion, uh, you know, how long, however long it takes. Uh, just one question, does the identifier accept uh, beginning with a digit and it shouldn't or? Yeah. Ah, uh -huh, okay, I, I thought it, it would be forbidden. Uh, no, 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 it won't be forbidden for the sake of brevity. Making it happen is not really all that difficult. You just have, uh, have to have a sequence which starts with a non-digit, uh, so either an ASCII letter or uh, underscore, and then this is followed by zero or more of all three of them. And it's as simple as that. And again, you need to map it to join it together into a single string, but it's like pretty trivial stuff. Um, okay, so... I, uh, have, I have a question. Oh, yeah? 
Thank you for this full. I'm amazed, mind blown, actually. How do you test? Uh, how do you test? You test by, you know, writing uh, inputs and verifying that uh, you get what you want, you know. So we did a lot of tests uh, for that, but uh, yeah. My problem is not more the acceptance, it's the rejection. Like, you know, you can still ignore cases in tests that will pass the parser and you don't want it. So um, well. Yeah, of course. I mean, we try to do as much as we could. Property-based stuff would uh, help, but it's uh, essentially uh, one thing that you do, and this is what I talked about, reasoning about the code. When you look at these little pieces, you can, in fact, convince yourself that it's really supposed to be rejecting, but this is, not, of course, uh, not really as reliable. So you have to try to make some uh, tests, whether by generative testing or by the proper testing. You know, but speaking of that, uh, I wanted to talk. So do we have another question, or can I just move on? Uh, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about error handling and you know provide some final closing thoughts but this is like all very informal at the current point you know how much time did I spend yeah it's like less than an hour so far so we have like 20 25 minutes anyway error reports right I said that error reports are suck suck you know and so they're like uh, it's not all that difficult so in the parser that we built at Aircloak we got to a pretty precise and very in informative error reports um, like a good place to explain this would be let me just find it uh, the keyword parser so this thing here, you know, like if I don't have select, I'm basically, because here I have satisfy, I'm going to get like term rejected or something, you know, which is useless. But what you really need, and this is low hanging fruit, you need another parser, which I could call, or sorry, combinator or both, you know, error. And basically error takes the parser as the first argument. If the parser succeeds, error succeeds. If the parser fails, then basically I get a function here, you know, I get the original error, and then I can return some other error like expected, token and then in backticks, for example, interpolated whatever the client expected, you know, and then you would have expected select and so on and so forth. And this is like uh, the very low hanging fruit which will get you quite far. Um, another problem is uh, that uh, you need to uh, report the correct position, you know, and this is where this implementation fails. So this is like a very naive implementation of parser combinators going into what I believe is the gist of them. But the real stuff, and you will typically use a third party library for that. Uh, just for the record, I measured at some point more than 50% of this code is generic. And typically you will use a third party library and this will be like around 70 lines of code or something like that. Um, and uh, anyway, the problem is, um, so this thing here, when we look at this first parser we wrote, we have an input and we return the rest of the input and this is the state of the parser you know so we get with some input and once we exit the parser we get the rest of the input this is the state in this implementation when you uh, want to report a location uh, you may want to expand the state to also contains the location so the current column the current line number whenever you encounter a new line character you bump the line and reset the column otherwise you bump the column and then you can of course this error uh, in all the parsers has to contain the location where you're currently finding yourselves at. That's one option. And the library we used for our SQL implementation already did this for us, so we didn't have to do it. Another option is that you return either the already consumed string or uh, the remaining string. From that you derive, which is the already consumed string, and you do another pass counting new lines to count the, li the number of lines, and then the number of characters after the last new line is the column, you know. So it's not, again, rocket science, and in many implementations, you're going to get this uh, for free, at least with it, you know. So that's one thing. And then we come to the finicky parts. So the thing is that uh, you have to be, that's what you ask, Amir, you have to be a little bit inventive uh, about every single piece of uh, the puzzle and, you know, try to see how it works and are you getting good uh, good results. We had a quite extensive error test simply because we wanted to see which errors are we, what kind of errors are we reporting. So like an example here would be, Going back to this thing here, you know, let's say that I have an error. So I have select, and then for example here, we are missing from, something like this, some table, you know. So uh, it would be great in this case to report that we are missing from at some location. Now, this is not going to happen, and this is the problem of the choice parser here. The choice is like, uh, if you heard of it, it's basically a backtracking technique. We try one branch, and then if it fails, we return, we try another branch, and so on and so forth. And uh, let's say that all of them fail. Which one should we report? You know, the, we don't know. So what we did, uh, uh, the one thing that our colleague did uh, is uh, he wrote like an alternative implementation of choice, which returns the error from the parser which went the furthest, which consumed the most characters. And that kind of worked in some situations, but it's not really like super reliable. Uh, but like the, I would say the proper technique in most cases is to do a look ahead. And what look ahead means is uh, we look into the next character or more of them, however many we need, and based on what uh, the value is, we make a commitment. 
So like if I see that the next character is an opening parenthesis, I'm going to assume that this has to be a subquery. You know, I'm going to treat it no matter what, it's a subquery. And that's it, you know. Otherwise, it's an identifier. So for example, this is the stuff that we use a lot. Uh, it will uglify the implementation. So like this choice is super expressive and elegant. This is where you're uglifying the implementation in order to actually get better, better error reporting. Uh, but you know, such is life. Uh, but it's not going to be like significantly uh, <coughs> uglier. So yeah, so much about error reports. Um, as I said, some final impressions from what we did. So our parser uh, was weighing in at around uh, 1,500 lines of code, yeah, 1,500 lines. Uh, you know, it's a lot, but it did a lot as well. Um, and uh, it's uh, quite possibly by far the most beautiful code I have ever worked on. And it's not even my code, you know. So there were four of us working. We were contributing equally. And it would sometimes pass like um, many months before I would return to this code, which would change drastically. And anyway, I would forget a lot about those details. It was super easy to get back into that code and understand what it does and make the change. And you know, like to be clear, we started super simple. We started with uh, one of our, we want to parse select foo from bar. <laughs> you know, it's like simpler than this. And it went all the way, you know, incrementally in small steps. We weren't really exactly sure what we wanted. And the fact that we rolled our own parser allowed us to, you know, move gradually and try different venues and whatnot. And this was a very big win. And I believe that like it was a really, really a good decision to write our own parser. And trust me that there were some crazy ideas thrown on the table when we were deciding the first implementation. You know? So again, there was this knee-jerk reaction by many people to you know, try to do whatever it takes to avoid writing a parser. Luckily, we didn't do it. So final parting thoughts is uh, like hopefully you're convinced that writing a parser is not all that difficult. Uh, granted, you may be confused you, if you see this for the very first time in a foreign language. Uh, it was a bit unusual for me as well. You know, I never did parser combinators before uh, we did that thing. The colleagues suggested parser combinators, so it was also f the same thing for me. Um, and I guess the only thing that I can tell you is, you know, try to practice it a little bit. Uh, you know, so it sits in because pretty much, uh, you know, after a little bit of practice, it becomes super intuitive. You know, it's very, very uh, maps very nicely to the problem. Um, yeah, you're going to use probably some third-party library or something like that. Like a good challenge that I could recommend is maybe try to parse a simple arithmetic expression. So you start like uh, your operands are integers uh, uh, and operators are the basic four, you know, plus, minus, uh, uh, division, multiplication. And you start super simple. You want to start just with single binary expression, then support like flat chaining of multiple expressions. Then you may want to support precedence. This becomes like an interesting challenge. Then you, wanna uh, you may want to uh, support parentheses. And once you build that est, you may want to traverse this est to compute the final result. It's a nice little challenge. And pretty much if you can solve that, you can build that SQL parser as well. Um, so yeah, write the parser when you have the problem of parsing. Regexes are still good for simple stuff. If you want to just a uh, couple of integers separated by dashes or something like that, I wouldn't write a parser for that. I would write uh, regex. You know, for anything a little bit more involved, uh, this thing here works uh, really like a charm. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, more questions. I have one question. So what about defining this language as a formal grammar, for example, BNF format or whatever, and doing some parser generation like Yak or Bazin or whatever? Excellent question. So this is, in fact, how we started. That's what the first prototype was my prototype. And the thing is that in Erlang, we have the counterparts of Lex and Yak. They are called Leaks and Yak, <laughs> so just an extra E. Um, and that's what I started with, you know. Uh, so we wrote, uh, basically, I just actually found somewhere on the internet there, there is already on some blog the implementation of a simple SQL written with that. I defined the lexer in a separate language, and then I defined uh, the grammar, simple grammar, and I had this demo, you know, working in no time with zero pre-existing pre knowledge. A bunch of that was copy-paste, but still. And then the colleague suggested parser combinators. And uh, the selling point for combinators was that it's not a DSL. It's uh, like you write it in Elixir, uh, and it's full-blown Turing complete, which is not really the case with uh, generators. So you actually have quite a lot of freedom to do whatever you want. Uh, I did a little bit of research. So just to be clear, I'm really not, like I'm pretty much still noob in parsing, you know, even though I did something a little bit at college, and this was my, the only the second time I ever did anything. Um, and uh, I even found out that like uh, for CLang and for GCC, they switched from uh, formal grammar and uh, basically generators into their own hand-woven recursive 
descendant parsing. And this thing here is basically just a flavor of the recursive descent uh, technique. Uh, the reason why they did it is there were a couple of reasons. One of them was because they didn't want to have like a separate DSL. Another one was because they felt that they could actually get much better error reports, you know, when they have full control over that. I don't really know, you know, if that's actually the case uh, in general, but th this was kind of our reasoning. Most, most notably, uh, or the primary reason is being for, uh, so we can actually write this thing in the same language where the rest of the implementation is written. You know, so it's a little bit less formal, but still good enough for us. Yeah, but there are definitely trade-offs. When you have like a formalized grammar, then you can clearly see the gr grammar. It's not gonna be 1,500 lines of code, right? It's going to be much less, yeah. Okay. More questions? Question? Uh, regular expressions, as, as typically implemented with backtracking these days, have these uh, nasty uh, pathological edge cases where they can go into almost uh, exponential uh, uh, number of, of, of backtracks. Does this technique uh, have the same problem, and how does it compare algorithmically to techniques like LAR1 parsers and, and all mm. that? This technique has the problems depending on how you write them, you know, so w with this choice, yeah, that's certainly the problem. For us, that problem was a non-problem because our input is relatively small. Even if you have like level 10 of sub-queries and joins and whatnot, it's still super small. The execution time after the parsing for us took, uh, in the best case scenarios, a couple of minutes. In a typical scenario, a couple of uh, tens of minutes, sometimes even hours. So for us, this uh, speed of parsing was a non-issue. Our parser could have been a thousand times slower and we still wouldn't feel it, you know? Um, that being said, like uh, more generally speaking, my impression is, and by pure logic, uh, when you write the recursive descendant, you can avoid backtracking by doing a look ahead as well. That's pretty much the same thing. So that's what I mentioned. You look ahead into a couple of next characters. By look ahead, what I meant is you read them, but you don't parse them. You just use them as an advice. And it boils down to the same thing, except you have to, of course, manually uh, hand weave it instead of getting like this thing from like LALR parser. And by the way, the Erlang thing that I mentioned, uh, the YEC is basically LALR parser. Uh, my l layman impression is that the recursive parsers are computationally like the best that you can get, no, so not computationally powerful, but like in terms of these classes of languages. Uh, because basically, uh, it's a free form, it's a free form Turing complete language. There is no formalism here. Whatever, you can write whatever you want in there. And so you can uh, compute even context sensitive grammars and whatnot, you know, with a bunch of hacks. Uh, so in terms of, uh, en you know, what can you parse? I think you can parse anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a quick question. So uh, writing this is, is really fun, but to actually get to the good parts, like good error handling and stuff, that's pretty boring. So uh, you did use a third party library, you said, right? Uh, for, you, for general purpose combinators, yeah, yeah. yes. Do you have any advice, like any recommendations for okay, so Elixir or other languages? Thank to you. be clear, in this particular case, if we were to do it again, I would write, write our own combinators. Yes, that sounds quite heretical. Uh, the, the thing is, I, I'm not really experienced with other types of, uh, without combinators in other languages. I mean, they're like super good to at least to get started. We were constrained here, you know, so for example, this lazy, this wasn't really supported, so we have to kind of hack around using undocumented features. Um, then there was also a thing we wanted to do two-pass uh, compilation. So this, this stuff with tokens, you know, it becomes like super clumsy, uh, super fast. And you have like a bunch of token, this token, that token, that is a bunch of noise. And uh, like a typical technique is to do two-pass parsing. So in the first pass, you, you take the tokens, and now your input is the list of tokens. Our combinator library assumed that the input is going to be a string. So we hacked around that too. We even submitted some bull request, which I don't think was ever really accepted. Um, and we had to do a couple of other hacks, you know, pretty much using undocumented stuff. And, you know, when I think about what the Combinator library gives me, uh, I wouldn't say that it's a lot, at least for those cases. Uh, now, there are some good uh, libraries, at least in Elixir. Uh, so there is, like, the famous one called, called Nimble Parsec. Uh, which is like super interesting in the in that it generates uh, this uses binary matching to generate like super fast uh, parsing. Uh, that being said, uh, even though you know it, this is written by Jose Valim and it, they, it mentions that it's a combinator library, I actually think that it's a generator parser generator, not a combinator, because it doesn't give you these lambdas which you combine. It for whatever you invoke, it generates a specification at compile time, 
and then it somehow generates the code. This is to me a parser generator. And I would still not use this in all the cases because it's optimized for speed, and at least in this case, speed was really not our concern. I want to have this combination of expressivity, you know, so I can neatly combine those things. So uh, for this case, I would roll, roll our own, you know, in retrospect. Yes? If you would do it uh, again, uh, would you, for some reason, try to actually use a full lexer before actually outputting? That's what we had. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mentioned. We had two paths. Uh, uh -huh. Sorry, so oh, it wasn't okay. clear. Yeah. yeah, we had a lexer which picked up tokens, assigned the column and the line number to those things, and then the second pass uh, and most of the code was this grammar, which was much cleaner. We didn't de do it initially, you know, so it was a refactoring at some point. Uh, it was all new to us anyway, you know, so like uh, we started with this, uh, just ignore these white spaces here and there. It starts super simple when you're parsing full from bar. It becomes much more complex as the parser grows, and then you figure like, okay, this is a bunch of noise, and I, I cannot even reason about this anymore. So we did a two pass, yeah. First one, pick up the tokens, assign them the position, and then you have like a pure grammar where you're building this tree. Yeah. And we use parser combinators for tokenization as well. <laughs> okay, uh, so before we stop, uh, yeah, I have one printed version of Elixir in action and a couple of more of uh, free ebook version. Uh, again, you know, if you want that, just approach me, ask for it, and you shall get it as long as I have something. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Sasha. Thank you very much.